okay, let's do it like this. By having those two things on the boat, when the boat's doing ace, whatever hull speed, but when the boat's in 22 knots of wind, or apparent wind, that's like having a one horsepower output on the bow trying to push it back the other way. If you could gain that for free, that one horsepower, and not have that outboard pushing you back the other way, wouldn't you do it? Of course you would. So hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I've not been sailing long, but as you know, especially with cycling, this channel is all about engineering analysis and the design principles that go into these sports. So seeing as sailing is one of my other hobbies, I've recently started looking at uh, the engineering design principles that go into sailboats, and in particular, modern modern racing sailing yachts. A lot of the principles that I discuss on this channel, whether it's composites or aerodynamics, also apply to sailing. If you're interested, stay tuned. If you're not, stay tuned anyway, because you might learn something about sailing or composites. So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about the design and engineering behind the latest generation, and the previous generations actually, of the Amoka 60 class racing yachts, which are taking place in the latest Vendée Globe, round the world, single-handed, unassisted sailing race, which actually just started a few days ago in France and is due to finish in about three months. So stick around. If you're not interested in the sailing, that's fine. You might learn something about aerodynamics and composites. And if you're interested in sailing, like grab yourself French red, a beer, cup of tea. So just a quick recap, if you're not familiar with the Vendée Globe Round the World Sailing Race, half it's in the title, it's a round the world sailing race, but it's unassisted, it's solo. So the skippers are on their own. There's no outside help. The boats are violent in this year's race. They're more extreme than ever. They're fast and they're evil. Now, considering this race happens every four years and the teams have basically four years to plan and engineer their challenge, still only about half the boats finish. So that goes to show how hard it is. Skippers might get around 10 to 15 minutes of sleep every day in really tough passages. And probably in the first 48 hours, like we've just seen, they might not sleep at all, such as the adrenaline and rush to get going. Now, it's probably the world's hardest endurance sport event when it comes to physical and mental endurance, I would say, way harder than Tour de France, which we talk about on this channel. Now, as if sailing around the world and navigating the world's oceans wasn't hard enough on your own, tossed into that load of deliriousness, lack of sleep, well, these latest Emoka generation yachts have just made that living hell a lot worse. Such as their extreme violence, speed, noise, and fragility, Combining that with a, an emotional, mushy human trapped inside for two and a half to three months may just be a simulation step too far. So this is an open class race. So the boats, all boats in this race are loosely governed by the same rules and there are a few key components that all the boats have to use, but there's still quite a lot of uh, open design ethos that can be added to the boat via its designer and, and shipyard basically. So each boat will have a designer, which may design a boat for a number of different teams and their design philosophy will go into that boat and, and it's very easy to see that in the different boats in this year's race, particularly more so than the last generation. So that designer might have a specific ethos they want to, they, they favour it and they'll put that into their design and then it's up to the shipyard which the team choose to basically engineer that design and produce the boat. And that may, that may take around two to three years and, and in, in this latest generation of Imoka boats, that is kind of design and build phase is taking longer and longer and longer because there's more CFD, there's more simulations that go, in, go into it and they're really leaving themselves a lot shorter now on, on basically sea hours. So they're, they're less tested. These boats haven't been tested so much as they used to be. A lot of the older generation in Mocker boats have been around the world numerous times. They found their faults, they've been fixed, they've been up revved, they've been revisions to those boats. They're slower, they're heavier, but arguably they're more reliable. They've done the things that are gonna break and they fix them. These latest generation boats on their first Vendée, on their first trip in the Southern Ocean is literally gonna be like testing a prototype. That's why it makes this race so interesting, is that the later, faster boats, the lighter boats, are untested. So let's have a look at why these latest generation Imoka foiling boats are so bloody evil. Let's start at the front of the boat. Now, if you don't know sailing terms, I'm gonna keep it really, really simple. I'll try and be as layman terms as possible. The bow is the front, the stern is the back, the port side is the left side, and the starboard side is the right side. But when I talk about beam, is another word you might hear, that means width. Now let's start with the bow. We've got kind of two different design philosophies with the bow. We've got the wave piercing shapes, which are a lot sharper, and we've seen those in the previous generations of the Mocker boats. And we've got more sort of voluminous, buoyant bow shapes with a lot more beam, a lot more width up towards the front of the bow. And we don't, we haven't seen that so much in this class of boat racing, uh, but we're starting to see that more. And there's one boat in particular, which is the Loxitaf boat, which has got a very buoyant bow shape. It's got a lot of beam up front, and it's very wide, and it's favouring buoyancy over 
ultimate wave piercing. Now each type, wave piercing or the sort of more voluminous bow shape, they both have the pros and cons. The buoyant bow shape works better as the boat speeds go up and we'll discuss that. Now the pros of the wave piercer, which is the kind of more traditional Wimoka shape that we see quite a lot, it's a very narrow bow, it's not got a lot of uh, beam, it's quite narrow towards the front, it's got a very sharp leading edge. Now just like in the name, they're designed to pierce through the waves instead of roll up and over the waves. And just, so there's, there's less crashing on the hull. So arguably the composites of the front half of the hull can be a little bit lighter. They're designed to cut through the waves so the boat's trajectory through the swell is a lot flatter. That helps in a number of ways. It helps the air stay attached to the sails better. It arguably causes less heel change as the boat rides up and over a wave. The heel angle is going to stay more consistent, which means the lift vector is going to stay more consistent off the side of the sail and the heel angle will change less. Now all those things help with efficiency, help with speed, and it certainly makes the boat more comfortable for the skipper in, in, in heavy seas if the boat trajectory stays flatter. Now one major drawback to the wave piercing design philosophy is, is basically the amount of water that the boat takes on when the bow pierces a wave in continuous swell. Now it doesn't just happen once, uh, swell tends to oscillate, it comes in you know sets, there's a period and there's a wavelength. And this happens repeatedly and repeatedly and you can basically calculate how much water is on the boat for a certain amount of time every time it pierces a wave. Now, having a flat trajectory is good. You know, I talk, talked about the sail efficiency. Now the boats are foiling. It helps the foil angle of attack stay consistent through the water. So the foil is less likely to stall. If the boat rides up over the, the wave and the angle of attack of the foil changes too much, the foil can stall and lose lift. Whereas the wave piercer will have a flatter trajectory for the foils as well as the, as well as the whole hull, so that's beneficial. But the downside is the amount of water that comes onto the decks and onto the coach roof when the boat consistently pierces waves in heavy sea state. And especially when the boat's going fast, it makes it even worse. Now, when you consider one meters cubed of water weighs a ton, a thousand kilos, and these boats weigh maybe seven, 8,000 kilos dry. So if you're taking on, let's say, three cubic meters of water every time you pierce a wave, you're nearly increasing the weight of the boat by 50%, which is, which is, just seems crazy. Now what happens when you're foiling, you're going quickly, or you're even not foiling, if you're just planing on the hull and going quickly when you pierce a wave, you take that water onto the decks and it can't get off quickly, the weight of the boat increases, you know, the wetted area gets bigger, the drag increases massively and the boat slows down and if it is foiling or planing, it loses lift and the boat will sink, which again increases the drag. Because the boat has mass, it has inertia, it takes that boat a long time to get back up to speed, maybe three, four, five seconds to get back up to the speed it was before it hit the swell, before it hit that single wave, and it comes back up onto the plane or back up onto the foils, and then it hits another one because the wave, you know, the period may be 20 seconds or something between, between the crests of the waves. Now, that's gonna be soul destroying for a skipper if just before it hits the next wave, the boat starts planing or foiling again, and bang, you've hit another wave, you take on another load of weight, you lose all your lift and the drag goes up again. And that'll just be oscillating continuously if you get if you get a very unfavorable sea state uh, with choppy conditions, like a moderate swell. And I see these these boats going fast and then the bow pierces a wave, which it's you know, designed to do, but it takes on so much water, the boat loses lift and loses its foiling capability. So I've just done a very quick kind of back of the uh, fag packet calculation. Now, excuse me, I'm just gonna grab my crib sheet because there are a few figures. So. Let's say you have a typical wavelength of 40 meters and a period of 20 seconds. That might be a typical kind of wind wave. That means if the period is uh, 20 seconds and the wavelength is 40 meters, that means the wave is moving towards you at two meters a second. Now, it, let's say you've got an unf unfavorable condition where the swell is coming towards you and you're going against it. Let's say your boat speed is 10 meters per second, so around 22 knots. So your relative speed against the swell is now 12 meters per second, like the closing speed is 12 meters per second. And that's gonna be pretty uncomfortable. Like I said, this is a worst case ca like calculation. If the wavelength is 40 meters and your relative closing speed to the wave is 12 meters per second, that means you're hitting a crest of a wave or the, so or the face of the wave every 3.3 seconds, right? Now, let's say you take on three cubic meters of water every 3.3 seconds and it takes the water two seconds to clear off the top of the boat. Now that means on that heading, in that sea state, in that swell condition, your boat is weighing 10 tons, not the seven tons it was supposed to do. Now, like I said, this is an extreme case, but that just seems absolutely crazy. That's 50% more drag on the hull, it's 50% more load on the foil, and it's not just that instantaneous time, it's the energy required to get the boat back up to speed before it foils again, like I mentioned a minute ago. It just seems crazy, and the only boat that 
I think really stands out that doesn't have this wave piercing shape is the L'Occitane boat, which is a very full beamy bow, which is gonna ride the waves more than pierce them. Now that does have its drawbacks as well, which we'll come on to. So the drawbacks of the wave piercer really are the advantages of the, you know, the scow bow or the volume bow that the L'Occitane boat has. Uh, it's not gonna pick up so much water onto the decks and the coach roof, so its weight in that, in that same swell condition, that boat's weight, so the loads on the foils and the lift requirement of the foils is gonna oscillate less. The oscillation of the lift requirement for the wave piercing foils is gonna be more pronounced. The boat's gonna pick up speed and lose it, pick up speed and lose it, pick up speed and lose it. Way more, it's gonna decelerate and accelerate way more than the, the, volume, the volume bow, which is gonna have a smoother uh, velocity profile for that sea state. Now, the drawbacks. Um, is going to be ultimately more crashing on, on the hull as the, as the boat takes off and lands on the other side of the swell there's going to be more crashing loads on the front half of the hull which means the composites in that area is going to have more reinforcement, more thickness and more weight. Uh, it's going to be way more uncomfortable for the skipper if it's not a wave piercer and there's just going to be a lot of slamming and banging going on continuously which emotionally and <laughs> mentally is just going to be absolutely torture. When, when you've got added speed and you've got a wave piercer, you've got more kinetic energy, you've got more momentum going into that collision. And the depth of the, the face of the wave, which the wave piercer is gonna cut through, is gonna be lower down than it was if you've got a slower speed boat. If the boat is going very slow and it's got a wave piercing bow, it'll still ride up most of the wave. If your boat's going really fast and it hits the wave at the same angle of attack, it's gonna cut through it if the boat's got more kinetic energy. And unfortunately, the more kinetic energy the boat, the lower down the wave it's gonna hit and the more water is gonna come on top of the boat. Now, one of the disadvantages of the L'Occitane boat is that when you've got the uh, non-wave piercing bow shape is that the wetted area of the hull, as the hull goes up and over the wave, changes drastically, which can change the heel angle because fore and aft, the center of buoyancy changes, um, the writing moment changes if there's, you know, there's less buoyant part of the hull which is out of the water, which is not adding any buoyancy. That causes the uh, the heel angle to basically oscillate as you go over the as you go over the crest of the wave. Now, not only is that uncomfortable, but it also plays with the lift vector that's coming off perpendicularly to the sail. The lift vector will be oscillating like this as the heel angle changes. So those are some of the reasons why you might not want to go to a, a, f a very full voluminous bow shape. And there is actually in a mocha class regulation of the maximum width that the bow can be a certain length behind the front of the bow. Now, maybe so many people in the media don't talk about the bow shape, so let's move on to what everyone's talking about, and that's the foils. And let's start off with the level of the foils. So, in the last generation of Imokas, in the 2016-2017 race, we saw the foils as a lot smaller than they are in the latest gen, and they still had very good, you know, planing or surfing hull shapes, and the foils were more of a sort of cherry on the cake to give a couple of extra knots boat speed in the right conditions and to provide a little bit of lift. Now we see the latest generation of boats really designed around the foils and uh, the hull shape is optimised for foiling and arguably it's a bit more compromised for just general sailing and planing and surfing on the hull. We still have the latest generation boats racing which are essentially better planing hulls with smaller foils which probably work more reliably in all wind conditions than the latest generation and, and even in the last episode of the race we saw Alex Thompson on the Hugo Boss boat he managed to come second even very narrowly second and he only had he finished with one foil one of the foils snapped off somewhere in the southern, southern ocean I think it was and for a, he was still on a port tack for a very long way and he wasn't even using the foil that snapped off it basically snapped off into a little carbon stub and it wasn't doing anything I think he was still managing to get 28 knots out of the boat and 25 knots of wind so those boats still sailed very well although a spit lower in the water without the foils but having said that this latest generation I wouldn't say it's still a full foiling hull like you see with the America's Cup 75 boats so the latest America's Cup boats are pretty much what I call full foiling boats they've got the T T-shaped rudder which is a lifting foil at the back of the boat so you basically got the whole boat propped up hulls completely dry out of the water and that's what I say is a full foiling you know hull and that hull is more geared towards aerodynamics more than is sailing but we still don't see that with the latest generation in, in mockers and I would say actually from a kind of layman's point of view these Imoka foiling principles are still very compromised you know they're basically propped up on three legs and one of those legs is the stern quarter of the hull. 
which is causing still a hell of a lot of drag when you compare it to the AC75 boats, which are completely lifted on, on all foils. So these Amoka boats are basically propped up on three legs, as I said, the, the leeward foil, the keel fin, which is acting kind of as a foil if it's canted, and the stern quarter of the hull, which is the really draggy part, which is really the limiting fa factor in speed. They don't have a, a lifting T foil rudder because it's banned in this class of racing. And compared to the America's Cup 75 boats, which are able to balance the lift of the boat with the, with the stern foil on the rudder, these, like I said on the Amokas, they basically have foils somewhere around midships. So in the middle of the hull, they've got the two lifting foils. And you imagine trying to fly a plane straight and level without having the elevator at the back. It's very hard to trim the pitch of the boat and fly it just on the two foils in the middle of the boat without anything on the back to balance it. And I've probably only seen one boat achieve that, which is the Chiral boat, where it's lifting on the two central foils with the stern hull completely out of the water. And even that, I'd say, only happens, you know, maybe one second out of 10 seconds, or it's just for the photos. They managed to capture it for this kind of photo because inherently they're unbalanced. It's like, you know, it'd be like trying to park trying to park a plane with just the two middle landing gear without the nose wheels it just wouldn't it wouldn't be able to prop itself up they need the hull in the water for reliability they need to, it needs to have a sailing hull still because these boats are going around the world they're on their own and yeah you can't compare it to an AC75 boat America's Cup boat because those are doing inshore races arguably very short they're surrounded by people and rescue equipment and those boats can afford to be a lot more experimental so yeah it's these boats have a, have a mix of reliability and foiling capabilities built in, but I would still say the upshot is they're kind of compromised. So they're compromised in terms of foiling ability because there's no rear stabilizer or elevator, and they're compromised in terms of hull aerodynamics because when they are flying, the hull aerodynamics to the apparent wind angle are pretty awful, and we'll get to that in a bit. I touched on it briefly before, but I want to talk about the reliability of the foils. Well, we saw like in the last Vendée Globe four years ago that Alex Thompson on Hugo Boss managed to come second and nearly won and he only had one foil on his boat. And for the majority of his passage north from the Southern Atlantic back towards France, he was on a, a starboard tack and the working foil was deployed in the water. And the broken one probably ended up helping him go faster because he didn't have the aerodynamic drag of the, the one that was on the windward side, which was sticking up out of the water, which would have been sticking up out of the water. In, in effect, it wasn't there. So he had less windage and less air resistance because the foil was broken. And the hull was still a great sailing hull and it didn't really slow him down that much. Like I said, he was able to do 28 knots and 25 knots of wind without the lifting foil. Now these boats are more designed around the larger foils and the reliability is really coming into question. You're like what happens to these foils if you hit a crab pot at 40 knots? It ain't gonna, it's gonna damage it pretty badly. It's probably not gonna stay attached. And if you're increasing the width underwater of the boat by double because you've got the foil sticking out each side, you're pretty much doubling your probability of hitting something in the open ocean. And there's so much crap in the oceans these days. Who knows what you can hit which is gonna damage the foils. And I think from, the, from what the designers have said, from what I've researched, there's no kind of sacrificial metallic protection on the leading edge of the wing of the foil like you might get on a wind turbine blade or on an airplane aerofoil. And I'd say the pr probability of those hitting foreign objects is much lower than something sailing around in our oceans given the state of our oceans these days. There's no sacrificial element on the leading edge. It's just carbon composite. And as we know, carbon composites are pretty poor when it comes to impact protection. But it seems the designer's gone all out on composites and saving weight and they're just winging it. Excuse the pun. 